Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you're joining from. And thank you for listening to this episode of CPA Review and More with your host, Phil Yeager. I'm your producer and director here at the Yeager Studios, Rob Medford, and together we are bringing you the number one podcast for CPAs and CPA candidates. If you're new to the show, I'd like to be the first to thank you for checking us out. We're excited to have you as part of our listenership. If you're here because you've already heard our show and you're a continued listener, we thank you for the ongoing support. It's always greatly appreciated. If you're in the market for a CPA review course or simply want to know more about what Jaeger CPA Review has to offer, check out our website at JaegerCPAReview.com or call our office and we'll answer any questions you might have. The link and telephone number will be in the description of this episode. Here at Team Jaeger, we're excited to tell you about our new Jaeger CPA Review subscription format. It's the same great Jaeger CPA Review course that you know and love on an all-new, month-to-month, no-long-term-commitment subscription format. But without any further delay, I'm going to pass the microphone on over to your host, Bill Jaeger. Rob, thank you very much. Hey, Rob, do you know something is really, I'm excited today. You know why? You got your haircut? Uh, yeah, sort of. That that excites me. And uh, you're going but, on a cruise? Uh, well, yeah, we're going out of the country because we're, we're actually being deported. Uh, <laughs> but that's another story. Um, anyway, no, I'm just disclaimer. Kidding. Jaeger CPA review. We'll no, but anyway, no, you don't know the reason I'm really excited today. Why are you excited? Because our guest Eric Bergmeier is a New Yorker. What else is new, Phil? You're always excited for New Yorkers. Uh, yeah, you know, I've been out of New York a long time. Uh, I've actually pr- probably been a resident of Maryland longer than I was a resident of New York. But, you know, you can't take the New York out of us. That's the whole thing. You can take the man out of New York, but you can't take New York out of the man. And I could not have said better than that, Rob. You are just a man of words. You really are. All right. But anyway, Eric, I want to welcome you to uh, our show. If Thank you. you. Call it a show. It's a little dog and pony show. But anyway, uh, Eric, you are in New Mexico, right? I am in New Mexico now. That's correct. Somehow you made a wrong turn uh, from Long Island to New Mexico. But anyway, tell me this. uh, What brought you, uh, what did you do in New York when you were there? Where did you go to school? I'm just curious. Okay, so I went to college, a small town in upstate New York at Clarkson University. I know it well. Oh, is that right? Okay, so right on the Canadian border. So kid growing up in New York, I wanted to get to the mountains. And the closest I could get to the mountains was, was in Potsdam, which is right near the Adirondack Mountain State Park region. And are you a skier? I am a skier. That's right. It, and the snow in upstate New York is nothing like the snow in with the Rocky Mountain area, right? That's right. It's, it's, it's not even comparable. I mean, it's, it's, it's really... I shouldn't make it such a big deal because I hate to have more people come out this way, but it really is truly a, 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 a special event to ski out here. I mean, if you are a skier, and this has nothing to do with accounting, but if you don't want to hear it, shut off your podcast. And talk and say. <laughs> anyway, no, seriously. Uh, if you're a skier, all right, and you live on the East Coast, the skiing is, people that are on the East Coast think it's great, all right? It's just icier. What did you do when you were in New York? I mean, you graduated Clarkson, Clarkson, <laughs> right? Yes, sir. And, uh, what did you do after graduating from Clarkson? So, um, you know, I had an Army ROTC scholarship, and um, right after college, I spent two years in the U.S. Army Infantry down at Fort Benning, Georgia. Um, so that was kind of a unique transition, thinking I would be going into public accounting after college. I ended up spending two years learning how to become a trained uh, infantry officer. Um, I was lucky enough, I, I did get a job offer with Coopers and Libran right after college. So they honored that upon my ability to leave the army a little bit earlier and started my public accounting career in Syracuse, New York, with at that time was one of the big six Coopers and Libran. Right, right. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know, they were actually a big eight at one time. That's right. That's and, right. I mean, kind of like when, when I started college, it was a big eight. I think when I started public accounting, it was a big six. And when I left the big six, it was the big five. 
So there was and a now, lot. Of- and now it's the final four. Now it's the final four. Final yeah. four, yes. <laughs> anyway, uh, so you uh, worked for Cooper's a librarian in uh, Syracuse? Yep, that's right. And what did you do there? Uh, so um, I, I did, you know, because upstate New York at that time was becoming more service-based. A lot of the big manufacturing is leaving to go either down south or to Mexico. We ended up doing a lot of uh, service-based uh, industries. Specifically, we were very strong in healthcare in the Syracuse office. So we did a lot of, uh, you know, the traditional auditing. We did a lot of uh, uh consulting work around systems implementation. And then at the time, there were beginning to be a lot of mergers in the healthcare industry. So we were doing a lot of M&A work. And we were doing that from Syracuse. We were going out to Buffalo, going down to uh, Pennsylvania, did a lot of work in, 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 in uh, Boston. Uh, so, so from that Syracuse office, we really went to quite a few different places. It was a lot of fun, interesting work. Is healthcare accounting different from uh, accounting for a retail store how is it different i mean they have their own accounts that type of thing the, the, the healthcare reimbursement when you talk today about the the cost of healthcare it's the administrative component especially that is is unique to healthcare the idea of uh, a, an individual going in being provided some kind of care and not ever knowing what the cost of that is and somebody else paying for that bill down the road just begins to even touch on the surface of the complexity of healthcare. But, you know, when I, when I'm finished with the tax return or when you want to go buy a shirt, you know what the price is at that time and you expect payment at that time. The, the complexity of how services are captured and then coded and then ultimately billed and then eventually collected makes healthcare very unique in one service provided by uh one service provided multiple times to different patients might be reimbursed differently depending upon who the insurance company is. If there is one. How did you learn healthcare accounting? So that was the best thing about for me in in going to public accounting, especially with Coopers and Library, because at the time Coopers and Library was very systems based in its audit approach. So we really had to go in and, and do a lot of recalculations of a bill and to test the system, right? Learning the internal controls. How does the internal control of the revenue cycle work in healthcare. And I'm embarrassed to say this, but back in the day when I did this, you actually had a, we actually had one of those little templates and we had to uh, manually draw out the flow chart and do decision points and, and then write it down in, in Microsoft Word, uh, you know, how the systems work. And then you'd actually go through and you do a lot of testing. All right, I'm going to be a charge and I'm going to go through the process. Um, and that's how I really learned uh, the healthcare revenue cycle. Did you enjoy that? Or did you find it uh, sort of like very detailed work that you didn't enjoy? Did you, you, can tell, work? You, you can tell, I think from, from the way I described it, I loved it. It was fascinating work. Did you work with other people or is it basically you're on your own on that? So no, you know, when I, when I did that, you know, you're working with the client and, and you're working with oh, okay. a multitude of, you know, so let's start the audit process where, okay, we're going into a hospital. How does, how do you generate revenue? Well, let's go first to the admissions office and then you go around to all the different specialties within the hospital and learn about how they do their part and how that data gets calculated, accumulated. And then you have to put this down on paper and then you're going to be either working with the senior or the manager explaining to them how the control system works and where there are opportunities, if there are opportunities to provide a, a value added comment on maybe we're seeing missing charges. And then going into the billing office and saying, okay, how effective are you on the accounts receivable follow-up process? And, and where are you missing there? So you, you, you're talking with all kinds of people in the healthcare setting, sometimes even you know the scientists, the phlebotomists, um, nurses and doctors, and then bringing that all back, getting that all together, and then working with the accounting team to making sure that the controls are reliable or they're not. Did that give you the training? Because you do CFO type accounting, and that's where companies, you're basically dealing with dentists, correct? That's correct. And they don't have a chief financial officer. That's right. Uh, and a lot of small companies don't. And yes. people like yourself, hire the, he'll sells out as CFOs. That's and right. Do all the work as a CFO, correct? That's right. That's correct. Okay. You, how did you get into the dentists? Uh, why do you like dentists? 
So, you know, uh, fast forward, you know, th there's a 20 year part of my career. And then the last 10 where I've owned my own business um, in the, when I purchased this accounting practice many, uh, well, 10 years ago, um, we were principally a tax practice and the gentleman I bought the practice from his wife was in um, equipment sales for dentists. Okay. So every time she, she furnished a new dentist, she'd ask the dentist, hey, doc, do you, have a, do you have a CPA? And the doctor would say, well, no. And he said, well, my husband happens to be a CPA. Why don't we um, connect you guys? So when I bought the practice, this, the gentleman I bought it from had a, you know, a whole a, a panoply of clients, and, but there was this little bit of, of dentists in there. In my, since I was, I'd been out here for a handful of years already, people knew of my healthcare background. Um, and then I was able to, as I started to talk to the dentists, they kind of got this, okay, I can trust this guy because he knows a little bit more about what I do. Um, and then I can kind of build more of that trusting relationship around, hey, I understand how your revenue cycle works. I understand where your pain points are. Let me see how I can help you. And it, it kind of went from there. And then I mean, there's a whole other reason why we ended up getting in so deep into to the dental community, if I, if I could share that later on. Uh, how are you, obviously, you know, you bought a practice. That's how yes. you came to New Mexico. Yeah. And uh, what size practice was it at the time you bought it? So what brought me out to, to, to uh, New Mexico, I, I actually, once I left Cooper's and Library, and I, I, I took a job with Cigna in Hartford, Connecticut. Okay. And then Cigna actually sent me out here because Cigna at the time, and still is a national, uh, you know, national provider of healthcare insurance. And right. Oddly enough, Cigna owned a hospital and physician group out here in Albuquerque. And it was kind of one of those things as they went through this aggressive expansion plan, they wanted, they were buying things. And somewhere along the way, they ended up buying a health plan that had a massive hospital system associated with it. When I ended up working for Cigna, they saw my resume and saw that I ended up, uh, that I had a lot of uh, healthcare consulting in my background. And the the delivery system up here was blowing up. And, and so they sent me out here. And that's kind of how I fell in love with Albuquerque. I came out on a whim and ended up staying. And I did a lot of other things out here. And then about 10 years ago, I said, you know, I'm ready to do something on my own. It just so happened the gentleman I bought the practice from, he was wanting to retire. And I would say, oddly enough, about 10 years ago to the day, I think is when we actually shook hands on a letter of intent with an effective date of January 1, 2010, to buy his practice. It's a small practice. Uh, how many, do you have employees or I do. You know, is I it do. just you? No, um, you know, when I bought the practice, it was me and, a, and another person and a half. And today we're just shy of 10 people. So That's over 10 terrific. years, you kind of put on a person a year. That is terrific. And this was, was this mainly a dental practice? Is that what you're saying? Or you had some dentists? I had some. I, I would argue, Phil, that it was probably what you would expect to see 10 years ago, maybe even today, in a what, would, what you would call a traditional tax and accounting office, where the focus was tax and tax compliance. We didn't really care what kind of industry you were in, but we knew you needed a tax return done. We could get that done. Boring, but that's what this was. Now, did you find when you first bought the practice... Was it generating enough income for you to live on at that point? Or must you have gone out and start marketing tremendously? All right. Did it generate enough revenue for you to live on at the time? You yeah, it did. And it, 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 to live, I don't want to say comfortably, to, to survive. We, we, did, we did okay. Um, you are married, correct? What's that? You're married. I am. That's right. And you, is your wife work too? Yeah, my wife is actually a CPA. Is she? And we work together. Oh, she's your partner? <laughs> she's my partner in the firm. She's oh, the reason well, why I passed the CPA exam, to be quite honest. Oh. So, Does she yeah. know you feel that way? Is it, do you ever tell her that she's... I tell her that all the time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because my wife and I, uh, she's not a CPA, but uh, she worked with me in this review business Yeah. Uh, since it started. And this has been yeah. like 42 years. Yeah. So what we say is we've been married. We take the number of years we've worked together. And multiply it by two. We've been married 84 years. You know, if that's the case, then we've been married 42 years. So congratulations. Uh, thank Don't you. put too many candles on the cake. It'll melt. Okay. <laughs> anyway, uh, no, that's interesting. I, I mean, you don't have it. How do you, how do you separate this? Uh, you have children also. I'm sorry. You said you had children. We do. We have three, three kids, three kids. God bless you. Um, you. you didn't sneeze, but I give you a lot of credit. Um, and 
do you find, obviously you have a business relationship. Yep. Does that come home with you? Yes. It does. I'm not going to lie. We can't, we don't check it at the door. And we try real hard. But what do you do happen. at the dinner table? You talk about business all the time? I will tell you that my youngest knows more about depreciation in section 179 than most adults do. If he's available, I could use this, a teacher in taxes. Uh, how old is he? So this is my youngest. Her name is Lauren, and she's turning 13 in another seven days. She would love to work with you. She no is- problem. We get her. You know what? We'll enroll her in the CPA program, and we'll get her to take the exam. She'll be an early. We'll call her Lauren Hauser. You got it. <laughs> <Instead of> Dugan, <laughs> right? 13 years old. Very nice. Yeah. And what's the other ages? I'm sorry. What do you have? My oldest is going to be 17 and my middle is going to be 15. So I'm going to have uh, three teenagers in, in about two weeks from now. Congratulations. And uh, they're going to all be in college at the same time, huh? Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be, well, I mean, they all know right now that I'm not paying for everything. And they do. I remind them all the time that I had an ROTC scholarship that paid for half my college. I expect them to do something similar. Hmm. Well, so. it's a good way of teaching them. Yeah. That they're not just entitled. You know? That's right. Yep. Yeah. So anyway, uh, your wife came in and yep. she came in with you right at the beginning, correct? I'd say she came in kicking and screaming. That's right. Now you do marketing, correct? You do a yes. lot of marketing. You do marketing for, you sell dental practices, correct? Yes. That, that we do that now as, as a part of all, all the suite of services we provide. Selling brokering dental practices is now the newest thing that we do. So you must have a real estate license to do that. Am I correct? You do not need to have that in the state of New Mexico. Um, only a few states require that. But New Mexico and Texas are not two of those states. But how on your practice itself, stepping away from the selling of dental practices, uh, how do you market your accounting practice? Uh, you know, we do a lot of uh, speaking engagements locally. Uh, we, you know, we, we set those up in restaurants. We partner with uh, uh, bankers. We partner with... Uh, supplier reps, we partner with equipment reps, we partner with financial planners, um, just other groups that are interested in getting in front of dentists as well. We usually have, uh, you know, timely, timely subjects about, you know, the changes in the tax law. You know, I love what the government is doing because it keeps me first and foremost in everybody's mind. Every year there's something new in the tax law. Obviously the tax cuts and job act of, of 2017 was extraordinary in the amount of changes. So, I did that presentation about seven times last year in different venues, um, and I'm usually picking up a client every time we do that. Who did you give that presentation to, and how did you get those people to come to the presentation? Uh, so it's, it's done to dentists. Okay. Uh, it's, it's presented mostly to dentists, and we, you know, we offer them uh, you know, light hors d'oeuvres and, and wine to meet us on a Thursday evening after their last day of work. Um, and, and that's usually what we do. I'm, I'm also invited, uh, New Mexico, as well as every state has, you know, a dental association and each one of our dental association has regions. So there have been other regions within our association that have asked me to come speak to them on their annual conferences. So, and, and, you know, it's kind of building that network, Phil, I, you know, since I know so many people in the, um, in the supply community. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they're always out and about and they're always talking to people and they say, hey, if you need ever need a speaker, you know, Eric Bergmeier, somebody we recommend you bring on. I don't charge for that, you know, and sometimes when I am traveling out, of, you know, since New Mexico is a big state, the associations will pick up my, 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 my travel costs and my lodging costs, but I, I do the presentation for free. Well, you have to, you know, yeah. that's the way you build up any business. You got to give things away free, you know, and that builds up business. It really does. It builds mm -hmm. up. You know, our business, we give away uh, different things for nothing. And there's nothing wrong with that. Great. Yeah. great no, we, yeah, we found them when we are really successful in bringing on new clients, it is usually days after a presentation because usually at the night, that night of somebody's got questions and their CPA is not advising them enough. Maybe their CPA is more of that traditional once a year guy their bookkeeper doesn't know anything about the tax law. So as we're talking to them, they really get engaged and like, you know, Eric, I'm just not happy where I'm at. Uh, I like what you're talking about. I like how you serve clients. Can I call you tomorrow? And that's usually what happens. And, and we, we typically pick up a client, a monthly client thereafter. And do you have a question and answer period? Yep. Okay. Yeah. I would, since you get their names, 
and they don't have any problem giving you the names and email address or whatever or, or phone numbers. No, uh, they, they do that. Okay. Uh, therefore, and, you know, I know today every, a lot of people just want to use emails. You know, write them a letter and just, if you don't hear from them again, send them another email. Well, you know, if you send them an email, you should say, I'll call you in 10 days. All right. And once again, you're telling them why you're calling them, right? You want to find out if they had any questions. And then when you call them, if they, you know, they should want to talk to you. You're not going, you're not trying to sell them life insurance. So they should want to talk to you. And also by talking on the phone, I mean, you're, I mean, I'm enjoying speaking with you. I'm sure they will enjoy speaking with you. You're, you're a very nice person. And, uh, uh, now, I don't know how your wife is. Is she nice also? <laughs> don't tell her I asked this. No, is it, how, how would you rate your wife on, you know, is she, is she a people person? I guess that's what I'm asking. Yeah, she is. I mean, we're, we're kind of a rather unique CPA team. I, I, I don't think people would normally think when they talk to us that we would both be CPAs. She was a cheerleader in high school to give you kind of the idea of who she is and still has that very cheerleading kind of mentality uh in the office my my that's everybody loves her they tolerate me well that's you need a cheerleader all yeah. right to keep people motivated oh yeah where'd you meet your wife in new mexico no i met her at cooper's and Librand. oh in yeah syracuse. yeah in syracuse yeah 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 we um you know she was a year too luckily for me you know because I, I was in the infantry for two years and then i came in and then she had graduated college and then so she was a year behind me so we were kind of close in, you know, in, in the classes, if you will. And I was really struggling to get motivated on studying for the CPA exam. And she was so determined. And, and I was too, you know, but it, it was great that we kind of connected and started our love affair, if you will, studying for the exam. I don't know. Is that, uh, not, yeah, not well, actually, funny. that's we've had many people who've had love affairs by studying for the exam. Really? Uh, no, actually, I'll tell you something. This is a true story. Uh, back in uh, Washington, D.C., when we, we used to run live courses before they changed the exam to computer-based, and one part at a time. So we ran live courses. Now, uh, what co our course went four months, five months in some cases, and we had a, probably about five or six couples that met each other in that class and got married. Perfect. Yeah, I mean, we were like the love connection of uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, now, for those who are a little younger, you don't know that show. Oh, no, wait a minute. It's on. It was on with Andy uh, Cohn. But anyway. You're right. Uh, so the people always said, Phil, I owe you two things. I passed the exam as a result of this course, and I met my spouse. Yeah. And I got invited to five weddings. But it's interesting uh, uh, how we were, you know, we always said we were part of helping these people get together. I really enjoyed the relationships. We, you know, with the live course, we had the relationship. All right. That's what I think is wrong with the internet. You lose yeah, your for sure. interpersonal skills. But yeah. anyway, that's, that's another topic. Um, now you, what made you go, you went for another designation called a CFA, not a CFA, CVA. What does the CVA stand for? A certified valuation analyst. Now, why did you go for that? I mean, here it is, you're selling dental practices. You have an accounting firm, all right? Were you going to add on another area, valuating businesses? Yeah, so the CVA came way ahead of selling dental practices. Uh, you know, the, the AICPA has their own designation. It's called the ABV, Accredited Business Valuator. Right. Um, I would just say that the uh, CVA, which is administered through NACFA, the National Association of Certified Valuation Analysts, in my opinion, just had way better marketing because I just got stuff from them all the time. And I didn't really know that the AICPA had a, a, a evaluation uh, designation. Uh, I probably would have potentially gone for theirs, uh, but I kept getting all this great literature from NACFA and they had a conference to do the training in December in Vegas. Uh, you know, and it was a perfect time. It was, you know, right before, I mean, it was after the holidays, before tax season really started. It's perfect dead time. So it was a, it was a six day course and they were long days. Um, but the reason why I, I wanted to get those credentials is uh, because I was getting so many new dental clients and, and, and I found that a lot of these kids and they are kids were overpaying for their practices. 
I wanted to try and help them uh, make sure that before they bought the practice going forward, you know, we did the appropriate due diligence and I could tell them from a level of certainty and confidence whether or not they were paying the right price or not. And I really didn't know how to do valuations um, previously. So that's why I went to the program. Dentists would come to you who were not your clients that would come to you to value, you would value their practices. I, I, I didn't follow oh, that. Oh yeah. So, so a lot of times what would happen was, uh, you know, a, a young kid would buy a, a practice and it would be financed through bank of America or Wells Fargo. And they said, okay, now that you're set up um, in it, because it in New Mexico and maybe parts of Texas, uh, you know, we've got a CPA we work with. We recommend you work with Eric Bergmeier. Now that you have a business, you got to worry about payroll. You got to worry about paying taxes. So now go to Eric for that stuff. And then they come to me and, you know, then now there's, now they're indebted way beyond what the business would cash flow for in addition to the student loan debt. And the banks, banks know how to value and they don't really care how much of a salary the kid takes. I mean, they do to some degree, but I, but I always found that the brokers and the front end of this always overvalued the practice, obviously to the benefit of the selling doc. Um, and then these kids find themselves a year later swimming in so much debt that they barely can survive. And I said, what I want to do is get in front of that process and then do the due diligence and then give them kind of the blessing that this practice is valued correctly in light of the information presented to me. So, so it's before they buy the practice, you want to value right. it versus after they buy and then they come to you and you tell them that they overpaid. There's nothing really they can do. Right. That's right. Other than grow the business. Now you got to grow it. You got to grow it faster than you even thought humanly possible because we need more cash flow to the bottom line. Yeah. Who, who sends you a lot of business uh, as a CBA? You get, who refers you business on that? Um, mostly, mostly the bankers. And you've established is Albuquerque a small, I mean, I know, or I know Albuquerque, but mm -hmm. is it that small that everyone knows each other or? I think when you look at where we are in terms of population, I think we, we may be 30th in the country in terms of size. So, you know, when you think about Houston, Chicago, LA, and New York as super giant cities, and then we somehow make the top 30, I mean, the top 30, we're less than 800,000 people. We're still big. Not everybody knows who I am. I'd love for everybody to know who I am. But, you know, we, we, we do a good job of being in front of the bankers uh, as much as possible. So they always remember who we are. How did you get these bankers? Uh, did you give presentations to them or how did you get them so that they would refer you to this business? Um, it, it did start that way. Presentations. And it started, are, you, yeah. What do you do? You send out, how do you, how do you approach a bank? You know, if you want to try to get them to uh, be a feeder to you as far as this type of work. Right. You know, it's actually for, for me, it's easy because they, they want to be in front of me first. You know, in the, the, lending, uh, the lending to dentists is at a really frenetic pace and rates, banks want to give dentists money. Their default rate is one of, is, is the second lowest of all industries out there. Um, and since they know that I've already established, uh, you know, a, 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 a reputation in town as being the dental CPA, they're more interested in getting in front of me, pitching their 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 terms, uh, than I am needing to get in front of them. I think to answer your question initially, about seven eight years ago, I reached out to one of the largest uh, dental suppliers in in well in the country, and they have a big office here in Albuquerque, Patterson Dental. And I met with the practice, the, the, uh, the, the regional manager. I said, I don't know how I can. How did you get through to the regional manager? Did you call up and just say, I want to talk to the regional manager? Yep. How, is that what you did? That's what I did. And they put you through? Yep. Now, is that true in every city or is that because you're in a smaller city? You know, I, uh, you know, I, I think in other cities, it, it may be sometimes a little bit more challenging. I think even here, you know, there's, there's a couple of big suppliers and, and it's just, it's, you know, I think I mentioned, I met a jokingly said, my CPA, my piece stands for perseverance or persistence. Sometimes you just got to keep knocking on that door until somebody opens it for you. Um, luckily for even me. Though, even though you'll get doors slammed in your face, you have to, you have to be the type that can handle rejection. You have to. I mean, you know, it's, it, you, you got to embrace it and say it's one more no to a yes. 
If you, if you have that mentality, you'll be fine in sales. Right. But some people don't, very few people have that mentality. I mean, to, I mean, I understand going and giving a presentation and then you send out the email that you'll be calling someone. That's a warm lead, but yeah. isn't going directly more of a cold lead? Yeah. I mean, you, yeah. So, so, I, that, and that's what I had now, mind you, I, th- I, I still had the connection into that particular um, supply company because a lot of my dental clients um, were, were clients of theirs. So you, you know, the, 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 the conversation starts that way. Hey, we're serving the same clients. How can we work with them together? And the guy That's says, you know, that here's what we want to do, Eric. And this is why we, now we want to work with you. We want to do these day of experts where we want to host events. And then let's have you talk about all these supply guys ever want to talk about is section 179. I mean, mm-hmm. thank God for section 179 because nobody can explain it, but you know, you put a CPA up and say you can depreciate it all in one year and wow, that makes a lot of sense. Right. Um, but that's what they had me come up on the stage and say, section 179, you can depreciate it all in one year. Okay. Drop the mic. <laughs> you know, but that's how they, that's how these relationships started. And in, and in that group of day of experts, we would also have a banker who would talk about lending for buying a practice, as well as lending for buying equipment or lending for build outs. Then we'd also have an architect who talk about, you know, building a new practice and then the contractor who talk about constructing it. And those are the kind of events that started this ball rolling for me where I started making better connections. Once that happened, you know, that one particular bank wanted me to be their guy. And then when the other big bank knew that, then they wanted to get in front of me too. So it kind of started that way. And you've told me that in New Mexico, a dental practice can elect to be an LLC, limited liability company. And of course, all right, I think you're automatically uh, considered to be a partnership unless you make a special election to be an S Corp, right? Yes. Okay. Now, so therefore you have a lot of flow through entities, correct? That's right. Do you explain to them the new qualified business income deduction? That's Yes, that was that's what made me a rock star uh, on the speaking circuit this last year. I was one of two CPAs I know of in the, in Albuquerque that was out talking about the qualified business income deduction, as it relates to the spe- specialized services trade or businesses, specified service trade or businesses, which obviously we as CPAs fall under that as well as most of my clients. Yeah, that was a real uh, you know a windfall for these flow through entities well you know for many but when you have a senior doc who's you know 60 years old he's an oral surgeon let's say his gross line is 150 well 1.5 million and maybe there's six hundred thousand dollars of expenses it don't matter what you do you got 900 grand of income you can't you we, we're not taking advantage of the qbid you know it's, it's the it's the younger guys that are just starting couple of years in where their revenue yeah, line. The people who are listening, uh, what you just said. Yeah. So uh, why the one who's uh, the 60 year old, uh, who's you said is about to retire, who has what, what was the revenue of the practice? I said 1.5 million. And their expenses was what now? 600 grand. All right. So they ended up with a uh, ordinary net income. income, ordinary they income, had net income of 900,000. All right. Now uh, they apply a 20% credit, right? All right. Can they get the 180 or what's the limitations on that? So if they're, it, it, let's just pretend they're married, right? Because they, 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 the numbers are easier because I've got them memorized for the married. Okay. If they're adjusted in, in, if they're adjusted gross income, if their taxable income is less than $315,000, they get full benefit of that 20% QBID. The moment their taxable income of, goes beyond the 315, it starts to phase out. Once they go be, before, beyond 415,000, they lose the whole qualified business income deduction, that 20% deduction. So do you get involved with a lot of these S-Corps that have W-2 wages? Because yep. that's also enters into limitations. That's right. Really, you know, this qualified business income deduction is not as easy. It's pretty complicated, isn't it? It is very complicated. It is very complicated. And when you have a a highly successful medical practitioner, professional services, anybody that meets that definition of a specified service trader business, which I think to some degree is still kind of murky, but they're very clear. Dentists, doctors, accountants, lawyers are in there, right? Um, 
yeah, if you make a lot of money, you don't get to take advantage of it. Now, can we plan in a way that maybe one year you may be able to? Can we do it in a way that if you take, if aggressively fund a cash balance retirement plan where you're putting a ton of money away? Were you planning a big remodel? Were you planning to buy a lot of equipment? Can we do that in a single year? So maybe one year you get advantage of it. All right, could you follow through on your example uh, with those additional items you mentioned? Uh, put, giving money to a retirement plan, how does that affect the qualified business income deduction? All of that goes to reduce taxable income. So our goal is to get taxable income, if we can, somewhere below the $415,000 mark for a married couple. And if we can, then we can take advantage of that QBID. So if that doc, and we did that for one guy in particular this year, uh, his, his taxable income was 450000 This was his first year in, in business, and we wrote everything off. So we got it down to like $270,000 because we knew going forward, he was, he's an endodontist. He's just going to be killing it. He's never going to be able to take advantage of the QBID again. So let's get it to him for one year, which we were able to do. So the goal is to drive down taxable income. Drive down, and then you get, you'll get some of the 20%. That's right. Okay. That's right. That's right. Um, would you say that New Mexico, I know you don't want people to come there, but would you say New Mexico, Albuquerque, is still a good area for someone to come and start a practice, or should they buy a practice? Uh, a dental practice or an accounting practice? Well, or practice. Or you know, they, I mean, I don't know how many practices are for sale in, in Albuquerque area, but you know, obviously buying a practice uh, may be a better way to start because you have a, already a you know, block of clients. Yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm with you. Uh, you know, I, I, I find anybody starting a business from scratch, especially if there's family involved, you need some kind of cash flow. You got to figure out a way to pay that mortgage and, and put food on the table. If you're a single person, maybe you want to live in a one bedroom apartment. Maybe you live in your buddy's basement. And you just eat ramen noodle all day. That's fine. You can start a practice from scratch. Three years in, you'll be fine. You'll have no practice debt. However, if you start with a base, I think that's where you want to be. When you buy a practice, uh, what percentage do you have to put down? See, that's the beautiful thing about a dent the, the the lenders to the, to the, to this industry. No down payment required. No down payment for the big banks. And you can finance it over how many years? Uh, ten years. Ten years, not bad. Yeah. And interest yeah. rates now are low. Ridiculously low. Are there a lot of uh, public accounting firms uh, who want to sell out retired people? Do you know of other? Uh, you know, firms that are willing to sell their practices out or is it very tight as far as that type of thing? Um, you know, and, and, and I'm, I, every once in a while, I'm getting something in the mail about somebody trying to sell their practice. I think it's kind of hit or miss at the moment on the accounting practice side. On the dental side, you know, we're seeing probably, you know, our office does maybe three to five sales a year now. Um, and we're probably doing about 10 to 10 to 15% of, of the market. Oh, okay. You're talking about dental practices. Dental practices. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, one other thing that was listed here, I just want to discuss with you. You say you have spent two terms as president of the New Mexico chapter of healthcare financial management association, and you are currently establishing an education committee dedicated specifically to the issues faced by the rural healthcare facilities in the state of New Mexico. What is that education committee you're establishing, all right, for rural healthcare facilities in the state of New Mexico? What, what is that exactly? Yeah, so th that, goes way, that goes way back into my resume. Um, it's not something I'm currently doing anymore with the HFMA, but when I was part of the Healthcare Financial Management Association, one of the big struggles and still is for the state of New Mexico is we are such a big state and sparsely populated that it's difficult to get current issues communicated out uh, and help uh, the controllers and CFOs in these rural markets do a better job of managing their hospitals or physician practices. So what we were trying to do was figure out a way to take a, a core group of, of, of experts and do kind of a roadshow kind of thing where we go out to the community. It was very difficult to do because you can imagine bringing a whole group of people out to a teeny tiny town 
to educate three or four people, you really can't do that uh, for right. a long period of time. Um, it still is an issue today. And, and I do work with rural facilities still in, in a CFO capacity. I'm finding more often than not, they're wanting to come here to Albuquerque from the rural locations. It's a nice town for them to spend a few days, get a better meal at a nicer restaurant, and then meet with me in my office and we can do a lot more education here. Now, you hold monthly education events in Albuquerque and you call them Doc Spot? That's right. What is that? Uh, we, you know, it's, it's an evening for the docs to come to, now we're going to be hosting them out of our office. We have them coming up uh, in another week, as a matter of fact, um, where we provide uh, education. Uh, this one coming up is uh, debt restructuring and how that may benefit a, a doc uh, if they're overburdened with debt. If, it, you know, today, again, with rates so low, depending upon when they did take on uh, either practice note, education note, equipment notes, uh, is there an opportunity today to, recon, you know, to, to reconsolidate that debt? That's this upcoming uh, presentation. We'll, we reach out to all of our, um, uh, our, our clients, and then usually we have some of our clients and prospects show up for that kind of thing. Is there, you know, let's assume you have other people who have clients, dental practices. You would have no problem if other CPAs contacted you, and would you do a client with them if they can't do the expertise? but they can get the clients? Oh, sure. All right, so if you're a CPA out there, or not even a CPA, you're a public accountant, all right, and you are picking up, <clears throat> excuse me, you're picking up dentists, but you really don't know it. You don't want to start doing the work unless you know what you're doing. So what do you do? Here's a person, Eric Bergmeier, who's been in that field for years. I'm sure he had no problem, you know, working with you on that client. Hey, he would make money you would make money. So how would they get in touch with you, Eric, if they have something like that? Yeah, you can, if, if my name is going to be spelled out for them on, on the um, podcast, you, it's easy to find me on LinkedIn. For starters, would be the easiest way. Eric, uh, once again, if you have any questions for Eric, uh, his name will be on the, uh, Rob, where do you show his name? We put it in the description with a link to the uh, LinkedIn profiles. And let me just say, I would recommend, Eric, if you need any help. Phil, honestly, one of the things I do want to do in these next 10 years is become more of a consultant to other CPAs who have clients that are exiting the profession. And if I can help them today begin to understand the finer elements that go into evaluation process so they can be better advisors to their clients, then I think we all win. I would love- Okay, to repeat that exactly. So people will hear that again. You want to be a consultant for what purpose? Yeah, so, so I want to be able to teach other CPAs about, I don't want them, I don't think I can make you an expert valuator, but what I can do is teach you the elements that go into the valuation process. So you as the CPA with some of my mentorship can now be better advisors to your clients that quite frankly, if you look at your clients, you, you're likely going to have a bunch that are approaching the age of retirement. And you should be asking them today, what's your plan? You know, are you just going to walk away from whatever it is you have, which would be a terrible shame. And if you think you want to sell what it is you have, let's begin to understand what goes into that process. And I would love to be able to help accountants, my, my colleagues, better understand that process. And if by chance I'm able to help them sell the practice, I, you're right. We all win in that process. Right? And does that include succession plans? You work that out too? Uh, yeah. So, so yes, we do. And that is a big part of the process, making sure you have the right candidate to take over your practice. Very good. How do you, as you exit as the selling doc and quite frankly, as the buying doc, how do you want that transition to occur? Do you just want to hand over the keys and walk away? Or do you want it to be more protracted? Is it a six-month period? Is it a two-year period? Is it a five-year period? It depends on a lot of variables. And, and all of those time frames have elements of success to them and or failure. Eric, I want to thank you for being on this program. And I think you shared a lot of good information from the people who are listening. And we have a decent amount of listeners. Let's just say awesome. we have a good amount of listeners. And they really want to learn. And I, I, you know, I learned today and I'm sure you provide a lot of good information for people. And I thank you for that. I really do. 
And I wish you the best of luck with your practice and your family. You sound like you have a beautiful family. We do. Also, tell your wife again how much you love her. I'll do that. Okay. And tell her, no, (laughs) I'm not Dr. Phil. Well, I have a PhD. But anyway, uh, it sounds like you and your wife have a great relationship and continued success with that also. Anyway, Eric Bergmeier in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Sounds like a beautiful area to live. Check it out. Uh, he, I'm sure, and mention it to your friends and neighbors because I'm sure Eric would like a lot, of, a lot more people coming to Albuquerque. Am I right, Eric? That would be nice. <laughs> now <laughs> tell me the truth. Tell me the truth, Eric. We're okay with what we have. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So, Eric, once again, thank you very much. It's my pleasure. Thank Enjoy you. Enjoy the rest of the summer. And I'm going to turn this over to Rob Medford. Rob. Once again, I'd like to thank you for being the best part of CPA Review and more with your host, Phil Yeager. If you have any questions or topics you'd like to hear on the show, or if you'd like to be a guest on the show to share your story, we want to hear from you. Send me an email to the studio at podcast at com. If you're enjoying the content that we're providing, we'd greatly appreciate it if you'd submit a review to the Apple iTunes podcast app to let us know how we're doing. If you're in the market for a CPA review course or simply want to find out more about the CPA exam and what Jaeger has to offer, check out JaegerCPAReview.com or call our office and we'll answer any questions you may have. The link and the phone number will be in the description of this podcast. Here at Team Jaeger, we're excited to tell you about our new Jaeger CPA Review subscription format. It's the same great Jaeger CPA Review course that you know and love on an all-new, month-to-month, no-commitment subscription format. Check it out today. Once again, my name's Rob Medford. I'm your executive producer and director here at the Jaeger Studios. And until next time, take care and be audit you can be.